Okay, uh, we'll get right into this. Uh, so the preliminaries, I'm uh, Charles Nutter. I work currently at Red Hat uh, on various open source things, uh, but mostly on JRuby, JVM language stuff, uh, making it easier for new languages to approach the platform, expanding the platform to include native languages and so on. Uh, so the structure of this talk is kind of going to be uh, a story, a, a play in three acts, talking about work that we've been doing on JRuby for the past almost decade now, uh, the challenges that we've had to meet dealing with the JVM and some of its limitations, and how the JVM and JRuby are evolving together to make this easier in the future. So we'll talk a little bit first. JRuby, of course, is basically just Ruby on the JVM. Uh, it's a project that's been around for quite a while. In 2001 was the initial commit to JRuby, which basically just started uh, implementing the parser. I think mostly they were looking at doing it for tooling, and then decided, hey, we've got a parser, we can make an interpreter, we can start building an actual Ruby runtime on top of the JVM. Uh, but for about five years or so, it didn't really move very quickly. It couldn't run most Ruby code. It was based on an older version of Ruby. Uh, the Rails singularity that happened within the Ruby community was during that period. And so around 2005, 2006, uh, I got involved in the project and we thought, well, why, why can't we? Is there any reason we couldn't actually have JRuby on Rails? Run, J, Rails running on top of the JVM, taking advantage of JVM libraries and the JVM itself. Uh, and in 2006, we actually were able to do this. We presented at Java 1 and showed the Rails running on top of JRuby, on top of the JVM a very early, primitive, hacked together form, but it was it was a beginning. Uh, fast forward to this year, and uh, we're working on JRuby 9000 now. Uh, this is actually the ninth major release of JRuby that we've had since 1.0, so 1.0 was the first one. Uh, and we're now looking at a JRuby that is orders of magnitude faster than the one from 2006. We're looking at running much more Ruby code, running Rails applications in production for real customers. Uh, folks like Square, folks like SoundCloud, that run JRuby as key parts of their infrastructure. Uh, and it's a lot of work to get to this point. This is what I ran last night just to see where our master branch was at. This is 29,000 commits that have been into, gone into JRuby over the years. And this doesn't count all the work that we've done on maintenance branches for each of these releases too. Uh, so there's obviously a lot of work. But why would we suffer through with the challenges of bringing a language like Ruby to the JVM for nine years, <coughs> almost 10 years now that we've been working on it? Uh, but the bottom line is that we, we were old Java guys. We know the JVM well. We know its ins and, out, ins and outs, or at least we thought we knew all of its ins and outs. Uh, and it, 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 it just fits the way we wanted to build Ruby. We want to be able to focus on implementing the functionality of Ruby, the language, Ruby's core classes, and not have to build our own JIT and our own GC and all those other pieces that the JVM gives us for free. So the JVM is kind of this magical black box that we can just throw our stuff at, throw our code at, throw a Ruby interpreter, do a little bytecode generation, whatever, and it will run our code great and everything runs fast. Except when it doesn't. And that's what the challenge and the interesting part of working on JRuby for these nine years has actually been. When the JVM can't do what we need it to do, how do we make that next step? How do we cross that line of impossibility? The JVM can't do it, most people just give up. We don't have an option, so we find new ways to do it. So we're left with this challenge. We want to make Java and Ruby work really well together. Uh, and not only work well together as a JVM language, but work well as a Ruby implementation. So Ruby users get the experience they expect out of running JRuby, uh, running Ruby on top of the JVM. And so we're going to talk about three specific areas here that have been challenges for us and how the JVM is evolving to make it a little easier in the future for folks like you and, and for us to continue working on JRuby. Uh, so first off, we're going to talk about just the, the most basic primitive concept in Ruby where all the performance is generally lost, uh, all those method calls that we make in a typical Ruby application. Uh, here's a, a metric I, I ran real quick just this morning just to see how many simple calls, and this is like just calling the foo method or calling a.foo on some object. Um, so there's other types of calls, doing super invocations and whatnot uh, that aren't listed here. But you know, for doing things like gem installing Rails and all of the dependencies that it needs, 315,000 calls that are made, Ruby calls, uh, making a, generating a new Rails application, 606,000. 
Uh, and this is generating the app plus installing additional dependencies needed for a running application. Uh, I did some, a quick CRUD application and just ran through all four operations. Uh, about 16,000 to do all, all four CRUD operations. Uh, so that's you know, roughly gonna be like a 4,000 per request just to do a really basic display of some data. So we need to make these method calls fast. And the problem that we always had in JRuby, we've got a, a simple example here, foo calling bar calling baz. Uh, and on Java 5 and 6, uh, what we were building JRuby on most of, the, most of its lifetime, uh, we've got all this extra call logic in between these. Uh, we need to go and look up the method type. We need to make sure we've got the same class in, in hand that we expected last time. We've got to do that dispatch. And unfortunately, the JVM is very bad at optimizing through a generic piece of code. And by generic, I mean you've got lots of different call paths that are all going through this same piece of code. That becomes a, an optimization black hole. Nothing can get through that, that set of calls. Nothing can get through that intermediate call logic that we have. And so most of the great JVM optimizations that we hope to get out of building Ruby on the JVM don't actually materialize. And that's where Invoke Dynamic comes in. How many folks are familiar with Invoke Dynamic, at least on the surface? Okay, so most of you have heard at least a little bit about it. Uh, we'll go through a little history here. Uh, the JVM authors actually did talk about having other non-Java languages on the JVM uh, and didn't, at least, it didn't exclude that possibility in the future. Uh, and because of that, lots and lots of folks have targeted languages on the JVM. Uh, some of the earliest ones were in, you know, 96, 97, shortly after Java actually was first released. Uh, some of the more, more uh, well-known ones, like Jython, were actually before 2000. Rhino, I think, was before 2000 or early 2000s. So very early, before the JVM was even considered to be a multi-language VM, people were building languages on top of it. Now the problem is that although the JVM was always expected that it could run other languages, it was never designed for a lot of these other languages. There are tricks like dynamic dispatch that don't, didn't work very well with a statically typed VM. Uh, there are optimizations that dynamic languages or other new types of languages would need, different sorts of call patterns. Uh, so we're stuck in this kind of, this, this bubble, this world of JVM opcodes, which is pretty much all we can work with. And, and there's three primary areas of operations that you can perform at the JVM level. You can do calls, invocation. You can access fields on objects, uh, set and get, so putting data out there for other threads uh, to see. Uh, and array access, again, similar sort of thing, putting data into some data structure that's going to be passed around and used by the world. These are the, pretty much the only operations that will potentially have some side effect, some visible side effect outside of that operation. Uh, and then there's all these other flow control and stack manipulation, numeric operations that don't really have any side effect. They're kind of functional op operations at the JVM level, but they serve to move data into the right places for these key uh, operations like invocation and, and data access. And if you're going to build a language on top of the JVM, you pretty much have to stay within here. You have to color within these lines. And that's where Invoke Dynamic really came into, uh, really, really enables the platform to do a lot more than it did before. Uh, this is from the JVM. This is the quote that I mentioned. Uh, In the future, we will consider bounded extensions to the Java virtual machine to provide better support for other languages. This is back in 1997, talking about the possibility of adding additional features just to support other non-JVM, non-Java languages. And that leads us to JSR 292, which was the Java 7 JSR for Invoke Dynamic. Uh, invoke Dynamic is basically a user-definable bytecode. So we've got our invokes and we've got our field accesses. This is a special bytecode that we program internally. It, the JVM asks us what to do when it runs into this bytecode, rather than having a predetermined set of operations that it knows already. Uh, it also comes with a set of fast method pointers called method handles. Uh, if you've seen the Java Lang invoke package, those handles are now getting to the point where they're much faster than calling through reflection. Uh, they can optimize much better. The JVM can actually optimize through those handles, through those pointers, as if it was a direct call. That's a very, op a very powerful way to start wiring things together, just with simple reflective handles that optimize nicely. Um, and then stuff for caching and invalidation. The general idea was that we wanted to build uh, a bytecode to end all bytecodes. We could, we could have this one opportunity to make a change to the JVM spec, which is really, really hard to do. We need to do it right. And so it was made very customizable, very configurable, uh, and it's, it's actually starting to play out really well for different languages. 
talk about a few uh, users. Obviously, JRuby and Groovy existed before Invoke Dynamic, uh, and we have grown into it. Uh, JRuby was pr the first adopter of Invoke Dynamic. We actually started using it before it was in, in a release, before it was even finalized as an API, just to try it out and help test it, kick the tires. Uh, I believe Groovy has a mode you can turn on now that uses Invoke Dynamic to great effect. Uh, new implementations as well, Dyn.js and Nashorn built on top of Invoke Dynamic from the very beginning. Uh, and so they're, they're getting the advantage of having that from the day one and designing the whole system around it. Uh, this is a little known fact that Java 8 lambdas and the, the, a lot of the Java 9 features are also building on top of Invoke Dynamic. All of these roadblocks that kept the JVM guys, the JDK guys from adding features to Java now start to get swept away as well. We can add Java features based on Invoke Dynamic that were impossible to do before, or at least hard to do efficiently. Very exciting stuff. And I'll talk a little bit more about how, how those work later. So now what exactly is Invoke Dynamic? Does anybody actually know how Invoke Dynamic works? Not one, awesome. That means everybody was gonna get something new out of this. Okay, so Invoke. Uh, We've got our four basic invocation types. Static for, you know, static methods, simple enough. Virtual, when at compile time you know the concrete class that you're calling against. Interface, when you're calling against an interface, you don't know what the concrete class is. JVM has to figure that out later. Uh, and then constructor and super calls, which are called special invocations. Uh, and these boil down into four different bytecodes here uh, with some of the, uh, the garbled internal mess that, that represents the method they're actually going to call there. And if we take these four operations and break them down into what actually happens at the JVM level, you'll start to see that this is largely the same thing for every one of them. There's minor changes, how it looks up methods, how it caches, um, optimization guards that'll be in place in some cases, but not in others. It'd be nice if we could take those pieces, those individual pieces out of each of these invokes and stitch them together however we want. Do caching our own way, do method lookup our own way. Uh, and that's where Invoke Dynamic comes in. All Invoke Dynamic does is call back to your code. You set up call site caching. You go look up methods. You go stand up values in memory. And then you give that back to the JVM and say, here's how you do this operation. Here's how this Invoke Dynamic is supposed to work. It does that from then on with these optimized method handles, with all the caching logic that you've got, and ideally optimizes it as if it was a straight through static call. That's what we're looking for. Uh, a bit more graphically, we got the, it's kind of a switchboard metaphor here. So up at the top, we make our call, and that's an invoke dynamic that we, we need, there's something out there, some piece of data we need to get, some method we need to call. Our invoke dynamic starts right there. That goes uh, to the JVM. The JVM uh, then will look for our bootstrap method. It's going to call back into our code, into user code from the JVM level. Bootstrap method finds the right target, wires everything up, and uses method handles to do it. That's kind of the wires here, connecting one call to another. Those method handles then will eventually terminate on that target method or target field or some piece of data. And before Java 7, you know, a similar sort of process was done for every, every call in Ruby, every JRuby call. Uh, but we had to do it every time. We'd go back through this process, look it up, maybe check a cache, do the call, look it up, check the cache, do call, it's, and so on, over and over again, and lost a lot of time. And then again, the JVM can't optimize through that. The magic with Invoke Dynamic is that after this first bootstrapping process, all of that stuff disappears, and you get direct calls from that Invoke Dynamic to the target method from then on. And that is where the real magic happens. So you look at JRuby on Java 7, that intermediate logic disappears, or at least uh, as far as the JVM is concerned, it disappears. We wire it up in a way the JVM understands a little better. We get straight through call paths, as far as the JVM knows. It goes directly from foo to bar to baz. And all of those great optimizations that we get out of the JVM, like inlining, actually do happen. And we, we see this happen, Ruby inline, to, in, inline into Ruby, Java inline into Ruby, vice versa. All of this stuff actually does work and works really well on current JVMs. So Invoke Dynamic in JRuby, obviously we're using it for method dispatch. Uh, it's pretty simple, our logic. Look up the method. Uh, we have a cache that says what the last type was and whether it mashes, matches. Uh, Invalidate it if the class changes or if some new type comes in. And we might chain those so we have two or three types that are available, three, two or three types of, uh, two or three methods cached. We also use it for places like constant lookup. Uh, in Ruby, constants are defined lazily. 
Uh, they can also be forcibly modified. Uh, it's generally not done, but it can be done. Uh, so we have similar caching logic. We go out and look up the constant. We have a cache that rarely is broken, rarely has to be invalidated. Uh, the JVM then can see that as a true constant, even, in, even though in Ruby it can change at any time, and it can optimize it as if it were a constant written in the code directly. All right, now how well does it work for us? Uh, this is a chart basically showing how much faster we are than uh, Ruby 1.9. The performance numbers for 2.0 to 2.2 aren't significantly different here. Uh, these are, this is JRuby baseline. Uh, this is, I think, JRuby 1.7 or so uh, on a Java 5 or 6, where we've got that logic preventing the optimizations from happening. And this is what it looks like with Invoke Dynamic. Just by switching these calls to use Invoke Dynamic and changing nothing else in the runtime, we get this much improvement, um, a significant improvement on the red black there, uh, so much so that we actually wanted to explore this a little further. So this is a benchmark of uh, building up a big red black tree, uh, traversing it a few different ways, deleting elements, and then you know, dumping it and trying again. Uh, on this particular benchmark, Ruby 2.0, and a pure Ruby implementation of red black, uh, took about 2.5 seconds or so. And this is, this is re usual reason why people in the Ruby world will turn to C extensions. They've got an algorithmic thing like this, a data structure, uh, a heavy, heavily hit data structure that they need to make fast, and so they write it in C instead. There's only so much you can do to get the standard implementation of Ruby to run faster. C is the usual go-to. And that does help. That brings it down to about half a second uh, for, every, for every iteration of this particular benchmark. And now this is the cool part. JRuby with the same pure Ruby implementation running the same benchmark, we're actually faster than Ruby with a C extension. And we're seeing this more and more, that rather than having to go to C to get performance out of Ruby code, people can just move it to JRuby and get the same sort of boost. All right, so back to the users, talking a little bit about how they're using it. Uh, Nashorn I mentioned earlier, built on Invoke Dynamic from, first, from the get-go. Uh, they're doing a lot more advanced compiler work, advanced uh, optimization. They speculatively say, okay, this is probably going to be a method that uses ints or longs. And then they use invoke dynamic as, a, as a, an escape valve. When it turns out you're not doing this algorithm against a long, it bails out via invoke dynamic, generates some new code, and then goes into that modified version. Very cool stuff. Uh, looking, uh, performance starting to be comparable to V8 on a lot of benchmarks, um, just by a, a little bit of extra magic on top of Invoke Dynamic. Uh, and they're, they're very interested in turning the work they've done on Nashorn into a general language framework. So everybody that wants to use Invoke Dynamic, a dynamic language, type specialization, optimizing numerics and whatnot, will be able to plug into this and have the same thing. So that's really cool. Uh, I mentioned that Lambdas in Java 8 use Invoke Dynamic. Uh, it's this, it works very similar to inner classes, but it lazily generates that class. It doesn't need to have that on the, on the, command, on the, uh, the file system. It doesn't need to be in the jar. You don't need these $0, $1, and all that. Uh, invoke dynamic is used to basically generate it on the fly, if you actually get to that point. And this is a, an example of a byte code. So we've got a sort that we're doing with a, a simple integer compare. That's our, uh, that's our lambda there. The invoke dynamic goes out and generates that class, wrapping all of this code that is used for the, uh, the actual string length calls and the compare right here. And then that class is returned and plugged right into the invoke dynamic so it never, never has to be generated again. It's as if that, virtual, that anonymous inner class always existed, but you don't have to have it on the command line. You don't have to have that extra, <laughs> that extra hassle of dealing with the files. Uh, this is, the uses of Invoke Dynamic get cooler every year. Uh, there will be no Java 9 is going to be doing generic specialization, reification for collections. You will have an array list of int that operates like you expect. It's one of the key features that's coming along, and it's built very heavily on top of Invoke Dynamic. Again, at the point where you need an array list of int, and you need a primitive collection, which we never were able to have before without specialized libraries, it will go off as the, in Invoke Dynamic, uh, call into some J JDK level code, generate what an array list of int would look like, and then plug it right back into the invoke dynamic. So we can actually have these reified collections without generating them all ahead of time, without having an array list of int and an array list of char. It'll all just work and it'll all plug in using invoke dynamic under the covers. 
very cool. And they've got working prototypes of this already if you want to try out the, uh, the Project Valhalla branch of OpenJDK. Okay, so I think that, that method call oper performance, uh, getting Ruby method calls to optimize the way we want is, is kind of a, a solved problem at this point. Uh, there's obviously the type specialization stuff we still need to work on. The next area that we really ran into and we still run into to this day is that Ruby is largely a wrapper around Unix or a wrapper around POSIX C. Uh, looking at a few examples of this, this is the Erno class and all of the classes defined under it for, for generating errors. And these are basically just all the Ernos that you'd see at C level, stuff if, that you would recognize uh, if you're building any application in C. Uh, another example, the Etsy library in Ruby uh, has a number of methods for, for accessing the password file on a Unix system, uh, group information, user information, and so on. And they didn't even bother to make these names nice. These are just the C functions pulled up into Ruby directly. So if we want to implement it and have all of the Ruby code out there work, we need to be able to do these things. We need to have these operations available to us at the JVM level. How do we do that? Well, and that's where having better native interop at the JVM comes in. So we look at the JVM world here. We got our nice, our nice happy area where there's no native code. It's write once, run anywhere, right? Uh, and then we've got this native world where we've got all these cool libraries that we need to call. We've got operating system features that we need to access, new libraries, new graphics uh, subsystems. And there's really no good way to do this right now as part of the standard JVM. Uh, There's a great quote from John Rose. If non-Java programmers find some library useful and easy to access, it should be similarly accessible to Java programmers. And this has not been the philosophy of the Java platform for most of its lifetime. Uh, the, the, the philosophy of the, J the Java platform has generally been if J non Java programmers find some library easy, useful and easy to access, we should port that to Java so that we can have it on Java. And then wh everybody who's done a port or a copy of a project knows that you're going to get out of sync, you're going to have to maintain two different versions. It's kind of stupid that we can't just call down into some of these libraries and use them directly, right? I, I think it seems stupid. So the example I want to go through here is what if we just, we just want to get the PID for the current process? We've got some uh, monitoring system or some administrative DevOps sort of thing that needs the PID so it can shut down, uh, send signals, whatever. This is not possible to do on the JVM right now. You can't even get the current process ID. Uh, the only way that you can get at it is if you're going to write some C code yourself and basically write an extension for the JVM. So for JNI, has anybody done JNI? Okay, there are a few folks. I feel for you. Um, in JNI, we've got our user code at the top that needs to make some call. There will be a JNI native endpoint on the Java side, some C code that represents what that, co that, that native logic is supposed to do, and then eventually we get to the target library. Uh, now, if you start looking at what JNI does, it's kind of deceptively simple here. Oh, we just stick native on there, and we've got a native call. It's like magic. Suddenly, it down calls into uh, native code, and we're, we're good to go. Uh, but then there's all this stuff that has to be done behind the scenes that has nothing to do with the Java code you just wrote. You need to generate the JNI headers for all of your native endpoints um, with some nicely mangled uh, function names so the JVM can find it. You need to implement that. For this case, it's obviously fairly simple. Uh, get PID returns an, uh, an int that fits, right, fits nicely into the JLong. We could do some casting logic to make sure it fits right or signed right for a particular call, but, but this is not ter too terribly bad. So we got our header, we've got our C file. Now we have to build it. And this is where I fall down because I don't know how to do any of this crap. Um, I don't know which libraries I'm supposed to connect up. And, on a per-platform basis, how I'm supposed to do this. Different compilers do things different ways. And then you got to think about users. Either you're going to have to build this ahead of time for all platforms, or your users are going to have to build it whenever they need to use it. And that sucks for them, too. So you're going to have to have make files. You're going to have to have other stuff that's not part of the Java world. There got to, there's got to be a better way to do this. All I want is a damn PID, right? So that was, that's where Java native runtime comes in. Uh, so the Java native runtime is a Java API for calling native code. We have a sort of a layered runtime, a bunch of different utility libraries that you can use. Uh, if, any, if some of you may have used JNA or have seen Java native access around, uh, very similar. We've taken some, uh, we've, we've taken JNR a little bit further. Uh, 
it's essentially a foreign function interface. If you've ever dealt with anything in the C world that uses FFI, it's a foreign function interface for the JVM. Um, and there's the organization on GitHub where we keep all the projects, JNR. So what we can actually do with JNR is go from this situation where we have to implement everything in purple here, uh, including stuff that's not in Java and has nothing to do with what we actually want to get done, to this. We've got some user code that defines an endpoint in some C library, says here's the library, here's the function, here's the parameters and return value, just let me call the blasted thing. The JNR stub underneath that figures out how to wire that into Java types, the JNI call actually makes the invocation, and then all that logic is pre-built for every platform, so we can just ship a simple library plus our two or three lines of Java code. So this is what getpid actually looks like in JNR. Uh, we define an interface that has roughly the uh, function prototype of the C function we want to call. We tell the library loader to create a version, an implementation of this interface based on the function coming out of some C library. And then we have in hand an object that we can call those C functions directly on. Much better than the JNI version, I think. Uh, I mentioned the layered runtime that we've got. We're going to go through a few of these. Uh, JNA kind of stops at the point I just showed. You can call into functions, you can define function endpoints, but there's not a whole lot of, of support code available for you. Uh, first of all, I want to mention the platforms. We don't want to have to rebuild this every time we go to a new system, so we ship with support for all of these platforms. Tiny little native stub that's in the jar, unpacks itself as needed, and then dynamically loads. Uh, if anybody has a platform that's not on there, I'd love to hear it. Uh, we do have... Yes, OpenVMS is, is, I think, working now. For all you OpenVMS users out there that really want to jump on that, um, AS400, Linux, mainframe Linux, we've got all the support for this stuff. Uh, there are certainly other platforms that are come along, but it's very easy for us to build the small stub on any platform, stuff it into our build, and it's good to go. Uh, so JNR FFI is basically the code that I showed you. That's the, the JNA equivalent. That's the basic library for, for wiring up some C library. Um, and again, there's that example. Pretty easy to do. Uh, and of course, once you've got the basic plumbing wired up, it's easy to add new functions to this as they come along. Uh, but of course, a lot of these things are standard operations that everyone's going to need, like getpid. We don't need to have everybody in the world write their own getpid interface and their own load logic to get the, uh, the getpid operation available. So we built our first layer on top of JNR, JNA, JNR POSIX which basically pre-wires a whole bunch of common POSIX functions that most users are probably going to need. Uh, this is a small snippet of the ones that are defined, things like uh, chmod, chown that you still can't do as well through JVM APIs. Uh, fork is on there and does not work very well. You can imagine what sort of horrible things forking a JVM would do. Uh, you know, things like GC, GC threads that don't come along for the ride, kind of a problem. Uh, what else is good? Our get pid call is in there. Uh, kill, doing actual signal operations, getting raw environment variables and setting vi variables into the current environment. Um, down at the bottom, hard to see here, we've got POSIX spawn, which is like the ultimate toolkit for spawning subprocesses. Uh, and uh, incidentally, there's a JNR process uh, package that I'm working on that skips all of the process builder nonsense and goes straight to a raw spawn call. So you get real, real channels out of that process. You can do select. You can actually control interactively a subprocess. Pretty much impossible to do through the JV, JDK process APIs. Uh, so here is what our get pid looks like now. We go to POSIX factory. We create a new instance. Uh, you can create your own handler. Uh, you can make air nodes raise an exception rather than do a return value, things along those lines. Uh, whether you want the native features to be enabled or use only the pure Java emulation of POSIX APIs. And then down at the bottom, once you've got it in hand, you just do the call. So we've got POSIX, uh, we've got a POSIX instance for every JRuby instance, and that's where all of our logic goes to call through to the, the native functions. Uh, so now we need to build a little bit more on top of this. Uh, what if we do a, a, a C-level open call to open a file or a, a socket call to create a socket at the native level? And we've just got a, a file descriptor in hand. Well, there's not much we can do. We can go back and do a read call at the C level and keep going out to the native side every time we want to do a read. Uh, but then you get things like select, which are more complicated. They're different across platforms. The APIs don't quite match. Uh, there's low-level control over these file descriptors that you really can't do at the JVM level. 
Uh, so that, that's where we get ENXIO, JNR ENXIO, Extended Native Cross-Platform IO. Now, this is basically NIO compatible, so it fits into all, everywhere else we use channels and streams in the JVM, but it does native calls for every operation through JNR. It does a native read. It does a native uh, KQ or ePoll for the select logic. It does the right things on all different platforms, but you can just pass in a native file descriptor. One thing that's really fun to do with this, you can take, the, you can take this and pass in any of the standard I.O. descriptors and have fully interactive, selectable standard I.O., which you don't actually have any way to do on the JVM today. You can't select against standard in, for example, when you're waiting for input. Trivial to do with this. Built on top of this, um, again, trying to add more of these features we expect lots of people are going to need, JNR Unix socket uses JNR ENXIO, provides a Unix socket implementation in an NIO channel, just looks like any other NIO channel in the system. Selectable, works like a socket, it's perfect. So what else can we do with this? Well, honestly, if we could have this at the JVM level, in the JDK itself, we could, do, we could have done NIO and NIO2 ourselves in Java, basically. We don't need to have the, J, the, the JVM include a bunch of native code to do these things anymore. And that's really exciting, especially for the JDK engineers that want to add some of these new features, especially like desktop integration. Have to wait for the next JVM version to include C code for it? That sucks. We don't want to do that. Uh, accessing unmanaged memory. A lot of people go through unsafe to allocate a chunk of memory and work with it directly. We can do that trivially. Call malloc. That's all there is to it. Call malloc and you get a pointer object back that lets you in interact with that chunk of data uh, out in the native world very easily. Uh, I mentioned selectable standard I.O. and process I.O. give much more interactivity to those streams. Uh, and then, you know, other socket types, new APIs, new crypto libraries, all the stuff we could do without ever writing a line of C code. So I think this needs to be in the JVM, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, Performance-wise, uh, getting back to why we don't use JNA, sadly, uh, we do a lot of work to make this run as fast as possible. Uh, the code leading up to the JNI call is generated, so ideally it's just one hop from your call to the JNI endpoint. On the other side, the C code, we actually generate assembly on the fly, link it into the JVM, so that it's hopefully one call from your native invocation uh, in the Java side to the actual library. So maybe two or three hops total. Uh, this is comparing JNA and JNR. Uh, JNA is the pluses. JNR is the circles here, and this is a, a logarithmic scale. JNR is roughly an order of magnitude faster than JNA. Uh, and so you can imagine when we're using JNA to do all this stuff before how much of a performance impact that actually was. Uh, you can improve it further. There's ways that you can customize these calls. If, for example, you're not at all interested in the Erno value and you don't need it to be saved off, you can throw ignore error annotation on that and get another 25% or so out of it. Uh, if it's a raw call that you know is unlikely to fail, like a get PID call. There is certainly more to do here, though. Uh, this is JNR uh, with, with and without the ignore error, JNI in the circles. Unusually there that JNR with ignore error is faster than the JNI version. I'm not sure why that is. Uh, and then the GCC03, uh, potentially optimizing some of this get PID call away, but there is still non-trivial work being done here for the benchmark. Uh, and it's much faster than what we have at the JVM level just going through JNR. So that's where Project Panama comes in. This is JEP191, FFI for the JVM. Uh, what we're working on right now, or what the JVM folks are working on right now, is the JVM side of this. How to actually make these native calls optimize fast so that when they generate optimized assembly for the Java code, it just goes straight through to a C call to get PID, rather than going through all of our extra plumbing. That's possible to do, and they're getting close to that now. Um, there's also possibilities of getting better security for this, having fine-grained control over, I want to load the libc, but I only want these functions to be mappable. Nothing like that exists in the Java security model at the moment. Uh, and then having method handles for, this is a native function, make it optimized like a method handle in Invoke Dynamic, so I can actually have my Ruby code do a native call, and it does the native call in the generated assembly. Cool stuff. And then, of course, native memory layout manipulation. There's lots of work on different structure shapes and, and uh, value types and other things that are being done at the JVM level. Uh, having more knowledge of what native code wants to see will make the JVM build better structures for those. So final area I want to talk about, Ruby equals objects, and I mean lots and lots and lots of objects. Uh, somebody did a, a, a measure of 
how many, how many strings a single Rails request creates during the process of handling it, and it was thousands and thousands of strings. I mean, the amount of objects created for just basic operations in Ruby, where everything's an object, uh, it can be overwhelming, and it really can swamp a system. Uh, I, I contend that allocation is really the root of all evil. 99% of the performance problems that I diagnose in Ruby, or in JRuby or other projects, almost always boil down to allocation. Uh, you really need to keep an eye on that, and so you need to monitor GC logs and whatnot. Uh, a, a more specific case here, JRuby 1.0 included a feature by default called object space. Ruby object space allows you to walk every object in the heap um, and you know, do whatever calculation you want on them. You can go look for all I.O. objects or look for all strings or whatever. In order for us to implement this on the JVM, we could use the debugging APIs, but then we'd have to have debugging APIs turned on all the time. Uh, so initially, we implemented it by having a separate weak graph, a weak tree of all of these different objects uh, with a little wrapper so that we could walk our structure in memory and that would see all the objects that have been created. And ideally, if they're weakly referenced, they should go away once it's been garbage collected. Massive performance hit from that. Every object that we create had to have a second double so that we'd be able to object space walk it. And it's for a feature that's only used largely for debugging or exploration, not used for typical runtime execution of the system. Uh, it, it'd kill any application if you use it at runtime, even on the standard implementation. So that was our first big boost. We were like, we just can't do this. Sorry, Ruby guys. This is going to be disabled by default. Uh, even at the JVM level, this isn't going to be efficient for us to do this. Here's, our actual, here's the G, some of the GC output for when we had object space enabled. Um, and note that each of these, there was 20, 28 more of these lines. We were pushing about 1.8 gig a second through the memory pipeline. And on my system here, uh, the max bandwidth I'm getting is about 10 gig. And so this is taking almost 20% of the memory bandwidth of the system for a simple benchmark in one application. Obviously not going to work. Um, this is after we decided to turn off object space by default. Very little evacuation happening here. We're not burning through objects nearly as fast. So now there are things that are hard to fix, unfortunately. Uh, closures and blocks, they need to hold on to and be able to modify surrounding methods, surrounding variables, and so on. Uh, so those need to be in a heap structure somewhere. There's no way for us to read across calls and see local variables in a method from a closure. Uh, numerics uh, in JRuby are still uh, all objects. So every time you do one plus one, we'll create a two object as a result. Uh, we are going to be working on some specialization above the JVM level. Uh, but ideally, we'd like the JVM to be able to see this and do it for us. And hopefully that coming, that's coming down the line. And then there's a lot of Ruby code that looks like this. We've got these transient data structures that are used to do some simple operation. Very convenient APIs. Here we're going to take each of these objects, we're going to call 2s on them to turn them into strings, sort them, and then get the first one out of that. Now unfortunately, this is going to create a bunch of separate data structures internally. We've got the map result, that's the 2s call. We've got the, the new collection that's a, that's a sorted result. And then finally, we pull one value out. Ideally, we'd be able to optimize through all that and just do the logic that does the, so the call and the sorting without the inter intermediate objects. And this is also very difficult to do on the JVM right now. Um, we can make it lazy, but that still doesn't help a whole lot because we're creating a lazy enumerator in the middle. Ideally, there should be no objects created here other than what the 2s call does itself. Can't do that on the JVM right now. So help us, JVM. Well, it does include a feature called escape analysis, which uh, I believe is enabled by default in the Java 8 builds. And the general idea here is that if it can see an object never leaves a piece of code and is never visible across threads, it will eliminate the actual allocation of that object and just use the data that's inside it. And then uh, recursively, if those are objects and they're never, they never leave this scope, eventually you get down to just primitive register values that optimize the way you want them to. Uh, unfortunately, this fails to work for us in pretty much every case, uh, primarily because the escape analysis in Hotspot right now can't work across any branch, which, I mean, every one of our calls has a branch to at least see that we've still got the right method ca cached. Um, so every method breaks escape analysis in JRuby uh, in the very simple form that's on the JVM. Hopefully there's improvements on the way. I don't know what the status of that is. So this brings us to uh, another framework that's been helping us bridge, uh, deal with some of these allocation issues, Truffle. 
So we start out, we look at what it takes to actually build a language on the JVM. And this could be a dynamic language, a static language, whatever you want. The same basic uh, steps apply. We have our JVM language that we've parsed and possibly turned into some uh, bytecode form. Maybe we have, just have an interpreter too, that's fine. Uh, but we're gonna take the case where we take a JVM language, we compile it into bytecode and then toss it to the JVM to run. Uh, the JVM is going to throw that into a bytecode interpreter for a while. Uh, it's going to profile it, optimize it, throw it into the JIT, and then eventually we get native code that comes out the back. And the problem is that all that magic in the middle, the cool stuff, we would have no control over. There's no way for you to give compile hints to the JVM. Uh, there's no way for you to tweak it at runtime. You can tweak some of the settings, some of the, uh, the the metrics it uses at the command line, but no way to change it at runtime. So we have no control out of this uh, on this section. And this is where it gets very frustrating for us. We try to find a way to uh, form fit Ruby code for what we know the JVM can do. That's not, what, that's not what we want. So what if the JVM's JIT optimizer were actually written in Java, and we could customize it and call into different pieces and, and change the way it optimizes our language? Uh, and that's where Grawl comes in. Grawl is a project out of Oracle Labs. 100% uh, Java JIT, essentially. Uh, you could think of it as hotspot ported to Java and then running on top of the JVM. Uh, it can either emit assembly or it can actually output hotspot IR, uh, which is the intermediate form hotspot uses to generate its code. So you'd have Grawl do its work, hotspot do its work, and then finally you get native code out the bottom. Uh, but you can directly control all this code generation and you don't have to, even, you don't have to use JVM bytecode, which can be sometimes a blunt tool. You can say much more directly, I want to access this memory. I want to call this function. So we look at this uh, with the Grawl setup. We've got our JVM language. Instead, we generate a Grawl intermediate representation. We use Grawl's bytecode, essentially. That's a, that goes into Grawl's optimizer. Um, and again, this is all Java code, so we can plug into this process and add our own optimizations that are language specific, uh, make things optimize more like Ruby should optimize. And then eventually we do get our native code out the back. Uh, but we got a lot more control over the process. Now unfortunately the problem here is that not everybody is a compiler writer, and this is a very low level, very rich, a very complicated IR within Grawl. Um, as you can imagine, this is bridging from the Java world to actual native operations, CPU level operations. So there's a lot of understanding required to actually write Grawl IR. Uh, we need something a little bit better than this too. So the dream is that we design the language, we've got some amount of steps in the middle, and at some point in the future, everybody loves our language and we travel around the world to talk about it. Uh, what we really want this to be is the absolute minimum amount of work. Write the interpreter and we're done. Everybody can write an interpreter. Probably everybody in here has written some sort of interpreter for a general purpose language or a specific language at some point in their life. If we could just do that and then have our language be as fast as everything, that'd be great. And that's where Truffle comes in. Uh, Truffle is a language framework built on top of Grawl. Uh, it, all you have to do is create your parser, so you know what your language looks like, produce an AST, and the AST gets marked up with some annotations in Truffle to say, here's an integer path, here's a long path, um, here's, how you, here's a, a data structure that's only going to be used temporarily. Uh, and based on the interpreter and the way that it runs, Truffle can actually do all that work in Grawl for you and optimize it as if it were written specifically, as if the VM were written specifically for your language. It's really amazing. A very similar approach to what they do in PyPy, if anyone's familiar with that. You write an interpreter and based on how the interpreter runs, it can generate a JIT for you. Really cool. So all we really need to do here is write our JVM language and create a Truffle AST. That goes into Grawl optimizes down, and we've got fast native code that's based on our language's actual semantics. Uh, Chris Seaton uh, is working uh, with Oracle Labs right now on a Ruby implementation as part of JRuby using Truffle. Uh, it's called Ruby Truffle before. We kind of call it JRuby plus Truffle now uh, because we, I, I guess I talked to the right people, we managed to convince Oracle to take this closed source Ruby implementation that was amazingly fast and give it to us under our licenses. I, I'm shocked that it actually happened, but it is part of JRuby now, and it will be released with JRuby 9000. And how much better is it? This is a graph on the far left, hard to read there, uh, JRuby 1.7 with Invoke Dynamic, which, as I showed, is four or five times as fast as the C implementation of Ruby. And on the right, the far right, that's Truffle, Ruby Truffle. Uh, 
uh, in some cases, as much as 20 times faster than JRuby plus invoke dynamic. And this is 90% of this improvement is because they can get rid of all those extra objects. Because it sees through allocations much better than the JVM does, and we can give it the hints that it needs to wipe those objects away. So I mentioned Ruby Truffle is part of JRuby now, and will be released in JRuby 9000. Um, there are many other languages in the works, and it's actually really easy to build languages on top of Truffle. Um, just the trivial case, an AST or an interpreter that just uses object, it'll still actually optimize pretty well. Then you can throw in your specializations as you need them. Uh, it might be become part of OpenJDK. Uh, it's a possibility in the future. It's not likely to happen in Java 9, given the time frame. Um, this is, the other half of this is that it's also forcing the hotspot folks to, to think about priorities. Uh, hopefully the hotspot guys will realize that you know, escape analysis uh, with, in, with, a, with unclear future for those objects is something we actually need. We need to be able to do escape analysis even if we can't op see through all the code. All right, so wrapping up here. So what have we learned? I mean, I, I can't really say what you've learned. Hopefully you've gotten something out of this. What I've learned over a decade of working on JRuby is that there's really nothing that's impossible on the JVM if we're willing to uh, route around it a little bit. And I've also learned that the folks that work on the JVM and work on the JDK are extremely interested in avoiding those workarounds and making it possible for us to just use the JVM as is uh, and have all, this, all these features come along without extra libraries and extra work. So hopefully that's what the future is gonna look like. The JVM does have a problem, but we can fix them. And in the interim, folks like us will help you route around them. Uh, now, one thing I wanna, the last thing I wanna say here is uh, this is all open source. Uh, you really can help with this. Grawl, Truffle, uh, all the JNR stuff, obviously JRuby, JRuby plus Truffle, the JVM itself. Uh, with that, with an open source, with a little bit of knowledge, nothing is impossible on the platform and we can make all this stuff reality for the future. Thanks.